In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So William Wilberforce came of age in England at the last quarter of the 18th century. And uh, at an early age, he inherited a tremendous sum of money, I believe from an uncle and some other relatives. Uh, and so his college years uh, were relatively without pressure, uh, and he spent a lot of time enjoying all of the frivolity of college. Uh, he was said to be incredibly popular um, and made friends very quickly, influenced people, and uh, got into politics at a young age, uh, almost as a rite of passage more than as a passion. And they said that he kind of uh, uh, took on uh, elements from both parties, so he was both uh, very well liked by both parties and, uh, uh, and distrusted a little bit by both. Uh, but he seemed to move in the wind uh, for the early part of his life. Uh, at one point, an uh, abolitionist came to him and said, we need your support, we need to use your popularity. Uh, there is an incredible injustice in this nation that needs to be addressed. Um, and they said for three years he didn't get back to him. Um, and he wasn't alone. Uh, England, uh, the Industrial Revolution was, was well underway, and there was a tremendous amount of prosperity in England, uh, and the fact that uh, uh, much of it was on the shoulders uh, of uh, slaves that had been uh, uh, brought over from Africa uh, wasn't pivotal uh, to people's sense of, of justice and, 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 and righteousness at the moment. Uh, but something happened to William. He had what was... Uh, apolitical at the time, what people of that social class uh, didn't go through. He had a religious conversion. People didn't even talk about it then. Uh, it was considered beneath them to have that kind of emotional response uh, to their Lord and Savior. Uh, but he had a moment of transformation, uh, and it converted him. Uh, and as uh, it converted him, he also felt compelled to change his politics and his life. Uh, and he began to realize uh, that there were injustices uh, that made the prosperity that he enjoyed possible, and he began to address them. Uh, it took him 50 years uh, to be successful. In fact, uh, the ultimate end was only three days before his death. 50 years he fought. He pretty much used all of his social influence. Uh, he used all of his political might uh, he used his material resources, uh, and uh, it was at a tremendous cost. But he believed that his singular pursuit, that carrying his cross, uh, compelled him to fight against slavery, to fight against uh, the slave trade, which was, uh, which was uh, uh, abolished sooner, uh, and then ultimately to fight against the abolition of slavery. Uh, he uh, lost countless battles in Parliament, he was challenged to a duel, he was threatened, he was ostracized, but he felt his conversion, uh, his claiming of being a child of God meant that he was called to carry his cross, and that cross compelled him to fight until three days before his death to abolish slavery. History has looked pretty clearly upon that and said, indeed, William Wilberforce, who we honor as one of our saints, was in fact carrying his cross. What does it mean to carry one's cross? That's not an easy thing. I think of the cross as that bold intersection between the realities of our life, the realities of this world, and the kingdom of God. The grace and love of God colliding with the world we live in. And a channel through that. A channel through the brokenness of this world to the hope and love-drenched dream that God has for all of reality. And carrying our cross is keeping our eyes beyond the cross to what God envisions for this world. But it's not always easy, and it's not always a straight line. A little more complicated story, but history seems to affirm it as well. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Bonhoeffer uh, one of the great theologians and eth Christian ethicists of, of any age, uh, he came of age uh, in uh, the early 20th century and was a prolific writer as the Nazi movement was coming to power in Germany, his home country. Uh, he was teaching uh, in Germany at the time, and he was given an appointment in Berlin 
uh, to which uh, he rejected as a protest against the fact that his teachings might be co-opted, uh, more importantly, God's teachings might be co-opted uh, uh, into the Nazi regime. And so he took a post uh, in England uh, so that he could um, uh, influence the rest of the world and make them aware of what was taking place in Germany. And some of his colleagues in Germany uh, questioned his loyalties and his uh, faithfulness to the gospel in leaving Germany in a time when Germany needed him most. He returned to Germany and uh, he had uh, underground seminaries to inform Christians that what was taking place was not of the gospel. Uh, they called them seminaries on the run uh, and he would go around teaching uh, and one of the things that he believed as a, uh, as a Christian and as an ethicist uh, was the call to pacifism. In his faith, he felt that that was what carrying the cross was. It was a commitment to passiveness, even amidst uh, the greatest aggressions. And that was challenged mightily. And he questioned, what does it mean to carry the cross? Where is the intersection between the world we live in uh, and the kingdom of God? And he questioned whether it might be through the assassination of Hitler. A devout pacifist, imprisoned uh, for fighting against the atrocities that were happening to the Jewish people, against uh, what was rising up in Germany, he questioned whether or not that cross led through murder, the assassination of Adolf Hitler. He was put to death. Uh, people question over time how involved he was in the assassination attempt, but the point is that he was unwavering in trying to find where is that intersection between the world we live in and the kingdom of God? Where is that channel through the cross to God's love-soaked vision for the world? It's complicated. All three readings are somewhat of a compendium of God's people trying to figure out what is their work in this time and place. You have Abraham and Sarah accepting this covenant, preceding the law. What does it look like to be in covenant with God? What does it feel like? What does it call us to be to follow God? Abraham was believed to be the greatest of all law followers, uh, but Paul in his letter points out that uh, Abraham's uh, time with God, Abraham's uh, fidelity to God, uh, preceded the law itself. So what binds us to God? Points out that for the Jewish people, for most of, uh, of the history, uh, it was the over 600 laws. In some ways, we would do well to have over 600 laws telling us exactly how we get to that intersection between the life we live in and God's vision for the world. If we just follow these 613 laws, we'll get there. But Jesus throws everything up in the air. Jesus says, I give you one law to love your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. I give you one rule to follow me, be willing to carry your cross. But what does that mean? Where is that intersection? Peter was, was befuddled. Peter had just been praised for getting it right. Just the, the verse before we get to today's gospel, Peter is commended because Jesus says, who do they say I am? And they say, Elijah, uh, Moses, uh, the, the Messiah. He says, who do you say I am? And he said, the Messiah. Even though he hadn't done the work uh, that was anticipated, he had not yet done what, uh, what people had anticipated the Messiah would do, the restoration uh, of Israel uh, to, its, to its land, uh, the, uh, the absolute fulfillment of all of God's promise had not yet taken place, but Peter knew who this man was, that he was the one. And then Jesus says, well, I'm going to have to go to Jerusalem, and I'm going to be killed. And I'm going to be nailed to a cross. I'm going to be humiliated. And I'm going to die and be buried and rise again on the third day. And Peter said, no, that's not the intersection. That's not the place. But Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you need to carry your cross. You need to find that intersection and you need to be willing to carry it. It's confounding work. And I've been struck since the beginning of Lent, which sadly was also the day of 
the Lakeland shootings. What is the intersection? How do we respond? What do we do? What does carrying our cross look like in a world that we've left to my children that didn't look anything like the world that I grew up in? A world where they worry about what's going to happen in their schools. A world with fears and anxieties that we didn't have to carry that make those Cold War drills look relatively benign. I don't have all the answers. And I don't know exactly what carrying my cross looks like. But as a religious leader, as a Christian, I can tell you it has preoccupied all of my free time and then some in this Lenten journey. And I think that's what Lent is for, figuring out where is that intersection in our lives? What does it mean to carry our cross? Does it mean speaking out <coughs> boldly? even if it's unpopular, or does it mean doing what Peter did and acknowledging what we don't know, listening more carefully, trying to figure out if my truth is not God's truth and isn't where God's leading me, listening to other people and trying to figure out where is the intersection between the world we live in and God's love-soaked vision for the world. Because we're called to put our eyes there, to put that front and center, make our journey to the cross a journey towards reconciling this world with God's vision for the world, being God's hands and feet in the world. Rodin was driving, the, uh, the sculptor was driving down the road and he saw this beautiful, beautiful cross. And he decided he had to have it. And he went and he bought it uh, and they loaded it up uh, and they put it on a truck and they brought it to his house and it didn't fit through the door and so he knocked down his house and he built his house around this cross. I'm using that as my model. It's not about wrapping the cross around my house. It's about building my house around the cross. Finding that intersection between our world and God's dream of it and bending myself around it. And it'll take a lot of listening. And it probably will take a lot of losing my own ideology of what's right and wrong, but it is a necessity. As much now as it's been in a long time for us to figure this out. Where is the cross guiding us? And walking it together. Amen.